Hello everyone and welcome to another review on BitTech. Today we have the Mountain Everest RGB gaming keyboard. This keyboard started life in March 2020 on Kickstarter where Mountain raised 227,000 euros from just over a thousand backers. Uh, it's available in many states from just a bare base to the keyboard without even any switches to the one we have here today which is the Everest Max which includes all the uh, possible accessories and accoutrement that you could have for this keyboard. So let's begin our ascent and see what it has for us. Oh, even I hate that one. So the box itself is quite nice. It has a rather snazzy uh, magnetic lip to it, which is a sign of things to come. Also has the mountain logo there with a raised plastic bit for the peak of the mountain, which is rather nice. Inside we find the keyboard, which uh, only comes in a TKL form factor, but that is expanded with the accessories they do, as you'll see shortly. Uh, this being the max version that comes with absolutely everything there's then a wrist rest underneath that connects by magnets to the underside of the keyboard so as i said before this is available in a bare bones kit where you just get the case and the pcb for you to put your own switches on this one uh, has Cherry MX Red switches on and uh, they are hot swappable so you can change them to whatever keys you want if you get bored of the type that you've chosen originally. Now it has a dual layer CNC machined aluminium faceplate and you can see around the arrow keys some of the machining marks from that CNC work. This one is adenized in black, but it does also come in a silver finish and it has perky RGB illumination. Turning our attention to the back of the keyboard, we have magnetic feet rests, which uh, are extendable with further sections. Uh, and it connects via a USB-C cable and has a USB type A pass-through as well. Putting the keyboard to one side for a moment, if we go back, to the box you can see that there is in fact a second drawer and this drawer is where you'll find all the accessories for this Everest Max model and what makes this keyboard unique and stands out in the sea of mechanical RGB keyboards. First up we have the modular media dock with display dial. So this has four dedicated media keys and then a fifth key to control the functions of the display dial and that can also have a custom screensaver on. The media dot connects to the back of the keyboard and can be placed either on the right edge or on the left edge and that connects via a USB Type-C connector. Moving on from the media duck, we have a detachable number pad, but this isn't just any ordinary number pad. This is a Marks and Spencer's number pad. The number pad has four programmable display switches along the top edge. These have a 72 by 72 pixel display, so you can have an icon on there to show its current function, and it can have up to five profiles, so 20 separate functions. It can be programmed for hotkeys, for starting programs, or even to perform various functions within programs, including OBS. So it's like a tiny little stream deck. This too has dual layer CNC machined aluminium faceplate um, and hot swappable switches and per key RGB illumination. This connects to the main body of the keyboard using a USB Type-C connector that slides out using this lever on the back along with another magnetic bar for a bit more security. This can then be slid right across to the other side so it can mount to either side of the keyboard. This too, like the main body of the keyboard, has magnetic feet to raise and lower it to your desired operating height and those magnets are pretty strong. We then have the USB connector to hook it up to your computer 
and it comes with a USB type A to type C cable and it's pretty stout and two meters long. In this Everest Max kit, there should also be a male to female USB-C cable so that you can connect the number pad to the uh, TKL base unit but have it a little further to the side. But unfortunately, that's gone AWOL in the BitTech office. As I've mentioned a couple of times, this keyboard is hot swappable and in this Everest Max kit, they provide you with five types of Cherry MX switch the uh, blue, red, silver, brown, and silent red or pink. Um, so you can have a test of the different switches and see if there actually is one that you might prefer to the ones that you have in your keyboard already, or if you get bored a bit later on. There is a plain escape key to replace the silver mounting one on the keyboard. And then we have eight of the magnetic extension feet for the back of the keyboard and number pad. And for those hot swappable switches, they provide a combined keycap and a switch puller tool. So that just about covers the main features of the keyboard and the accessories. I've got a couple of videos that I need to edit, so I'll get this hooked up to my rig and really put it through its paces. Then I'll report back with a more detailed look at the more unique features of that media duck and the programmable keys and whether they actually have any applicable real world use or are just a bit of a gimmick. So apologies if this footage comes out a bit rubbish, but I'm having to record it on my phone so I can get the camera close to the keyboard on my desk. So here we have the uh, keyboard on. You can see the screensaver I've set to the BitTech logo. And these are the four default um, programmable keys that uh, Everest Max comes with. So the first button there, that takes you to Mountain's website. And um, I thought that was a little odd. I, I thought it would have sort of gone and found the Basecamp software to load that up, but you can set that in the settings if that's what you want. There we have uh, Open Explorer up. That one puts your computer to sleep and then that will bring up Task Manager. Zoomed into that dial, that this is just the screensaver, and as soon as you tweak that round, it'll bring up the menus. So we've got the clock settings, so you can have the time and the date, and this is the selection key, and a double click will bring you back out. You can also have a stopwatch on there if you want. And then finally a timer. So if you need to remember to go and take something out of the oven so you don't burn your tea while you're gaming, you can set a timer up. And the second option is the profile. So I've got three setups. If I set it to profile two and just have a look down, the keys have stopped flashing. And then a third profile setup which again sets the keys to a nice bit tech purple. Next is the lighting so you can change the various modes on the fly so if you zoom back out you can change between static, colour wave, tornado, breathing, reactive, matrix, and custom which will be the one that you've uh, set up yourself if you have done and then yeti which is this weird blue and white uh, which i guess is their mountain thing and if you want them off you can do that on the wheel next up is brightness uh, and this is the brightness of the leds on the keyboard and i'm not sure why that's not next to lighting and you can't change the order that these appear in, which I think is a bit of a, a missed opportunity and a bit of an odd choice to have them separate from each other. If we zoom back out, so you can see that. So I've got it on 25, so it's not overwhelming the uh, camera on the phone. Um, and that 
also adjust the brightness of the um, customizable keys as well. Next up is the system information section. Uh, I thought this would give the clock speeds and temperatures, but as it takes its information from the task manager performance tab, it only really gives the utilization of the various bits of hardware and your internet speed. Next up, an actions per minute counter for all of you real-time strategy fans. And the last one is a custom mode. Now, this will only work if you have set up a custom operation for the dial in um, Basecamp software. And I don't have on this particular profile, but we'll look at that now. So this is the landing page for the Basecamp software. Um, if I also had Mountain's Mouse, that would appear on here to customize the settings on that. But we've just got the keyboards, you can either click there or on the top. So this first page is where you can select between the different profiles, set up new ones and delete ones that you no longer need. Uh, to the right, you can set a name for the profile, you can set up a picture for that profile as well. One of the really cool things about Basecamp is you can set the profiles to launch when you launch a particular program. So if I load up Resolve, that should automatically switch to my Resolve profile. And then you can also set it so if you close that program, it will then revert back to the previous profile. Uh, they can be imported, duplicated, exported, and reset to default here as well. The second page is for the RGB LEDs on the keyboard. We have all the effects here on the left hand side. The custom mode is for when you want to set the per key illumination. So I've got a couple in green, one in red and one in blue for the various functions I use most of the time in DaVinci Resolve. Um, so you can select each key individually to change their color. You can also click and drag the mouse to change a whole section of LEDs as well. These ones around the outside are some LEDs that are situated between the two CNC layers of the faceplate. They can also be changed by selecting a color and then dragging it along or by changing individual spots. The key binding page is where you can assign various functions and macros to the keys on the keyboard and also the programmable display keys and the uh, media duck. So on the display keys I have it set to launch resolve, paint.net, goldwave and bandicam. Basecamp will also automatically load an image to be displayed for the program and it does that based on whatever shown in Explorer there but you can also change that to something else if you want by clicking on the pen icon and then uh, finding the picture that you want to assign. If we just select another key so the other functions you can assign are operating system commands so we've got task manager, calculator explorer, browser, uh, lock the computer, shut down, sleep and hibernate, uh, run programs as you've seen, run a uh, macro that's been set up in the macro page that we'll get to in a minute. Uh, then you can also assign the media keys elsewhere as well if you want to use those for something else. And then finally the OBS Studio commands. So we've got start and stop streaming, recording, profile selection, transitions and durations and a few different volume controls. So to use a macro first you need to record one. I've got two very simple ones just for the right and left arrow keys. I've got those set up so I can assign those to the uh, media duck scroll wheel. So if I go into the menu here, go into custom, then press the button again to activate it. Um, I can then scroll one frame at a time using the wheel, which is quite nice. In the uh, macro setup, 
you can record both the mouse and keyboard inputs set a delay that you want uh, that's how you start recording and then you can set the playback rate for once hold it or to repeat it until you press the key again so on the display dial page first thing we have is this show menu section uh, with all the various options beneath that and a little check next to it now i thought that this would remove them from the display dial don't show them but they're actually still there it just skips them when you're selecting it and considering that's not just backlit cutouts but a proper LCD screen I think it's a bit odd that they chose to do it that way and not just remove them and spread out the remaining ones that you want to see so the next option is the clock type so if I get that up you can set that to an analog clock and on the digital whether that's a 12 or 24 hour clock Further to the right we can turn the screensaver on and off and adjust the time it takes for that to come on. It's a little difficult to see here but there is a pencil there to adjust that and change what the screensaver is. Now one thing that's a bit tricky with these pictures is say I've select this one that's already on there it just sets the picture up on the screen wherever it likes whereas if you select a new picture altogether you get this circle so you can say exactly where it is but that's not quite how it works this top curve is indeed where the curve of that will finish but it actually has quite a lot of space down on this bottom section so if I crop that bottom of the bit tech logo off and say okay it does actually get shown you can see it a little better on the um, white bit tech logo where you can see it almost has this extra bit down the uh, bottom that that framing piece doesn't show. Uh, you also don't get to uh, reframe the picture once it's been loaded. If I select that, there's no way for me to uh, select exactly where that will get situated, which is a, a little frustrating. Another missed opportunity with this is that the screensaver is universal across all the profiles. So I'm on the DaVinci profile now, if I go onto the general one that has the same screensaver, and I'll change that to the white bit tech logo, then if we go back to the resolve profile and the display dial, you can see that's also changed to the white logo. And I think that's a bit of a shame and another missed opportunity as you could personalize that screensaver to the functions of that particular profile and just those extra little touches which seem to be missing. It does also take quite a while to get some pictures loaded onto it, uh, but unlike some other software like the uh, one for the MSI K360 and its small LCD screen, it's not fussy about the format or size of the picture that you upload to it. You could have some massive 4K landscape and it would still just squeeze that on to wherever you framed it. Then lastly on this section you can also set the screen to turn off to prevent screen burn in if you want. And then finally you can set the uh, menu colour and that is just the small little bit that scrolls around the outside. I've killed it now. This does happen every now and then where it will just say no and doesn't actually want to do anything. Let's take it off. Hopefully I haven't killed it, have I killed it? Ah, it's 
interesting. Let's unplug it. And plug it back in. There we go, we've got it back. That was weird, not seen that before. Good job, I got it on camera. So this last bit here is for the menu color, which is that little bar that goes around the outside showing a little more what option you're on. And you can set that to any color that you fancy. There you go, that's now in red. So this last page is just a couple of general settings. Uh, the keyboard has what it calls a game mode where you can disable certain functions like Shift Tab, Alt F4, Windows key, and you can enable that as shown by the G there using the function and pause key. We then have this indicator LEDs option. So the indicator LEDs are these ones here as I've just shown when you enable game mode. Also uh, scroll lock, caps lock and dumb lock. Um, but this is supposed to enable and disable them but it doesn't actually do anything. Which is a bit rubbish but it shouldn't really affect you too much. They are very small LEDs. Then you can uh, select a keyboard layout, which is for people who've bought bare bones kit, or maybe even for people who've bought a keyboard in a different language, which has the type of switches they want. Then they can change the key caps and change the language in the settings here. Uh, you can reset it to factory defaults. There's a link to download the manual. And this is also where you update the firmware. And I thought this was gonna be a quick one. So, did I like using the Mountain Everest? Uh, really didn't at first. And the main reason for that being because this makes an absolute racket. Hopefully this mic will pick it up. Otherwise I'll put a clip in. I got a fever. And the only prescription is more cowbell. sounds like somebody jumping up and down on an old steel bed. The switches in there must be dry as the Atacama Desert for that amount of noise to be coming from it. Now Mountain do sell some switch lubricant but really for it to be coming to you in that state is quite atrocious. There's even a foam dampening layer in this keyboard for that exact issue so to still get that kind of noise out is a little worrying and uh, now this was sent to the uh, BitTech office a little while ago before I got my hands on it but we're only talking two or three months or something like that I mean it's not a length of time um, that this should fall into this state really I mean that's going to have been a factory problem um, if I'd have spent £230 on it, you're damn right this would have been going straight back with that kind of racket coming from it. Luckily, most of the time I've got my headphones on and I'm listening to the videos that I'm editing, YouTube, music or the game I'm playing. So um, it tends to drown it out. But sometimes I just like a bit of peace and quiet while I'm doing something on the computer and this keyboard just shattered that. Shut up! Noise issue aside, um, it was fine to use. Um, I sort of forced myself to use the uh, special features on the keyboard, the programmable display keys and the media dial. So as I said, I had uh, the dial set up to uh, do a, fr a frame nudge in DaVinci Resolve. I actually used that quite a bit and I, I quite liked that function, but the dial itself is a bit cheap and plasticky and has a little play in it. And for supposedly a, a premium keyboard with its dual layer CNC machined um, like aluminium top, that's all plastic. And I think that's kind of been overlooked a bit for the fit and finish. I mean, at the very least, this should have a, a metal bezel and a, a glass um, top, like a, a watch, uh, maybe an aluminium faceplate for this. The, the buttons are, have a, a fairly positive uh, firm click to them. They don't wiggle around a, a lot, but uh, especially in that dial, that's just a, a little bit cheap and a bit contrasting to the, the, 
the rest of the quality of the board which is very good the uh, magnetic feet are quite like um i have my keyboard fairly flat so i didn't extend them but they are really strong i've just turned off the computer that was powering it yay so that would be the uh, sleep shortcut on one of those programmable display keys working all rather too well which is funny because they quite often don't uh, the main purpose i had for those was for launching programs that i load and shut down a lot while i'm editing and uh, it quite often like lost the shortcuts i would press the button nothing would happen and it would be the same for all of them and i'd have to go in still show the correct link to the exe file the program hadn't been updated at all and um, for whatever reason it just lost that link and i would have to relink it so that was really frustrating and would often break my workflow if i'd sort of gotten used to them um, and they were just programs that I had locked on the taskbar anyway, or on the start menu. And as I'm used to going to them there, I just forgot about that function altogether because it was too unreliable. That's not the only thing I had a problem with either. Uh, it was prone to throw a wobbly every now and then and just break or the software would crash, the um, keyboard would become unresponsive. Uh, within the first five minutes of having it on my computer, I tested that sleep key. Fine, went to sleep, went to wake my computer. When it woke, the keyboard was unresponsive, as was the software. So I had to restart my computer to get that working again. I tried to recreate that, having everything open that I did, trying to remember what page in the software I was on, exactly what I was doing. And I tried for about half an hour and it didn't present itself again. And at the time was after filming the uh, per key illumination B-roll and the LEDs just went mental. And again, the keyboard became unresponsive as did the software. And I had to uh, unplug the keyboard, shut down the software in Task Manager and then plug it back in in order for it to work. And it had completely screwed up the RGB profile for my DaVinci Resolve editing profile, which was rather annoying. Um, so, I mean, some of these things are due to the immaturity of it. It is a fairly new product. I had installed the latest firmware on the keyboard and the latest uh, revision of the software. So these are bugs that will be present now. Um, and if you're uh, somebody who needs reliability and you're not somebody who can put up with those um, sort of shortcomings, then maybe this isn't the keyboard for you. Those uh, features in particular as well, I don't think they're really um, that unique. Um, they're essentially just macro keys. They've just got a, a little display on them that's just media keys i mean yeah you can program that into it and it's got a few of the little bits on there but so has like ancient logitech keyboards like the g15 have little displays on them so it's not exactly new neither is the um movable number pad i mean there was the uh what is it the microsoft sidewinder x6 which is the first one i can remember where you could swap it from side to side my brother had one and i was really jealous but i mean it's not that much of an advantage when you can buy a separate number pad with mechanical switches for 20 quid off amazon um, there are newer ones around like the uh, Asus Rog Claymore that have that functionality as well. It's also attached a little flimsily and um, I need to move about quite a bit in my chair so I don't get too stiff. Uh, easy now. Um, and in trying to lift it up it just comes right away. And I feel like over time if that happens too often that USB-C connector will just eventually work its way out. Um, and then you're going to have to seek a replacement. Talking about the USB-C connections that both the uh, number pad and media dot use, while you have a type A pass-through, 
And um, while both of these are connected, you do have two vacant USB-C ports on the top and side where they are not. Um, uh, but you can't use those to connect any of the devices to your computer. And I think that's uh, another missed opportunity there on the keyboard. So you could have a total of three pass-throughs. I did try and use one of them as a pass-through just on the off chance it would work. Uh, I think it was the opposite side one um, and it just made the number pad drop off. Um, and as soon as I unplugged it, the number pad sprung back to life. Um, really, it shouldn't be that hard to program in. Is that our hardware attached? Yes, right, okay, that's our hardware. Or no, oh, that can be a pass-through then. Uh, and I think it's just lots of little missed opportunities or, or little niggles um, in a keyboard that's meant to be about those finer details that just really put me off it in general. Um, it's fairly pricey at £230 for this Max kit. Now they say that this is quite a good value proposition. And you think £230 for a keyboard is a good value proposition? Mountain claims is good value as the uh, core edition, just the TKR board is £150. Uh, the max is 230. If you bought the core and all these separate pieces, that's 285, so a 55 pound saving. And 230 pounds is still pretty pricey, uh, but they're saying, but the competition is far more expensive. Their competition is a Corsair K95, an IQ Nexus, and a Stream Deck Mini, with a total cost of 380 or a K100 with those same two accessories at a total cost of £410. Um, now for one, why do you need the IQ Nexus and a Stream Deck Mini? Um, while they may say, ah, oh, well, the, the Nexus is a bit like the media controls there, and then the Stream Deck a bit like the programmable keys, but both the K100 and K95 have media keys and a little scroll dial, which is exactly like that. So you definitely don't need both of those. And in fact, the Corsair IQ Nexus, um, that's a, a touchscreen LCD bar that you put at the top of the keyboard that has six programmable buttons. So two more than that, but it has 200 pages. So a possible 1200 different buttons which is a little more than the 20 you can get out of that and really these are all just macros anyway and both the k100 and k95 have six programmable macro keys and um, no they don't have a display on them but does that really matter once you've programmed them you don't really tend to look at what you're doing. It's more of a feel and a touch. You're playing a game. First thing you do on a new game is you set up your keys exactly how you like them. Everybody's a little bit different. So having them able to display, I don't think is really that key a feature. Both the K95 and K100 are full-size keyboards and you definitely can't move any of those buttons around. So you might say, aha. 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 So that's where this has its advantage, its customizability. But really, you're gonna find where you like them the best and keep them there. Um, once you got used to the layout of the K95 or K100, would it really make that much of a difference? Um, even if you think, ah, oh, but what about the detachable number pad? You can get detachable number pads for £20. So then maybe the best option is one of them, uh, the K70 um, TKL Championship uh, Edition, is it? And then the uh, IQ Nexus, which has far more uh, possible buttons than uh, these four do and um, that might be a better option might cost you a little bit more but there are plenty more tkl boards out there as well to really drive down that cost um and then there's the software on this that just falls over all the time and and takes the keyboard with it 
and that can really break your rhythm and concentration if you're gaming that's that's fatal um so it's i really couldn't recommend this keyboard in its current state i mean i really get it i love the idea of it i just think the execution is wanting and the software just doesn't have the maturity and stability to be worthy of £230. So hopefully Mountain come back with version 2 with a, a few tweaks to its functionality, usability and uh, quality on some of the pieces and I really look forward to that review. and hopefully that review will be a bit quicker. If you're new to the channel, welcome. If you've enjoyed today's video, make sure you give it a thumbs up. Comment down below, what do you think of these additional features that keyboard manufacturers are coming up with? Do you think they're gimmicks or do you think there's genuine use and purpose for them? And uh, are you willing to pay the extra cost for them? Uh, make sure you subscribe as we've loads more reviews and mods from Alessandro and Mod of the Month coming up and you don't want to miss out on any of that. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram and Twitter for all your latest tech news and reviews, links of which are down below with a link to our Discord server and also our merchandise store. Make sure you check that out, there's loads of cool t-shirts, hoodies and you can pick up your very own BitTech mug and help support the channel. So that's it from me and the Mountain Everest Max RGB Gaming Keyboard. If you've made it this far, congratulations! You probably feel like you've scaled Everest. I'll be back soon with another review and I promise to make it a quick one. But until then, take care folks, stay safe and I'm off to go and make a five hour documentary on how to empty the recycle bin. See you then.